they taught society how to think in these terms, how to do cancel culture. This is largely on them, at least in a contemporary setting, it is largely on them. These people tried hard to cancel our last election. In case anyone has managed to forget about that, they want theocratic rule or at very least a leader who will give them what they want along any conceivable line and remove anything from society that makes them uncomfortable or goes counter to what they believe. Don't give evangelicals too much power inside your head. They taught society how to think in terms of cancel culture, and now it's starting to turn on them. First, they go after society, and then they go after each other. But guess what? Now, society is coming for them. You want your entire country thinking like this? You've got it. Now prepare to reap the whirlwind. Welcome to Unbound, a podcast for new atheists and lifetime atheists, ex-evangelicals, truth seekers and free thinkers there is life after faith and life here is good it's time for a new perspective and a better conversation i'm spider and i'm shell and it's time to get unbound you know i find it somewhat ironic that we're sitting down to record an episode on cancel culture on saint patrick's day yeah because i mean saint patrick is pretty much the patron saint of cancel culture pretty much as the story goes and it's completely and totally wrong but according to catholic lore saint i almost said saint peter saint patrick was responsible for driving the snakes out of ireland i have news for you there's plenty of snakes in ireland yes at this point That's the popular story. That's the one that everyone hears in school and every place else. But in reality, it wasn't the snakes that he was trying to drive out of Ireland. This was an attempt to eradicate paganism in Ireland. So in our wicked days, we were never all that big on St. Patrick's Day. And even today, we had our corned beef and cabbage yesterday. Right. Because it was cheap this week. Yes. Not because it was St. Patrick's Day. It's like a once a year indulgence that we enjoy, but not because of that. So we've kind of canceled the idea of St. Patrick's Day around here. And that <laughs> happened around the same time that we got into Wicca. I'm Spider. And I'm Shell. And with all of that build up, we're going to get into talking about cancel culture and how evangelicals and Christianity in general, this goes way, way, way back, not just with modern evangelical churches this goes way back and we're going to talk about the different hats that this has worn over time and the types of things that comprise it because there are multiple facets to cancel culture it's not just coming out against whatever the thing is today that we don't like right this has been a thing for a very very long time Before we get into the meat of our message, just want to let you know that our Patreon is out there, patreon.com slash Unbound Podcast Network. If you have a fiver you can send our way, we'd be more than happy to put it to good use. And if not, then just keep listening, keep enjoying the content, get what you need from it, pass it on, share it, let people who need to hear this message know that we're there, you know, all the same things that we say every week. I remain convinced that This may not be a unique message, but we have a unique voice. And if you agree and you think our voices should be heard by more people, then tell more people about us. It's going to help us out tremendously. And if you have the means to support us financially, then we greatly appreciate that. Onward into our main topic. So we're talking about cancel culture. And let's start out with just a brief definition of what this is. Put simply, cancel culture is a new but not new phenomenon that has been fueled by things like social media and other information age resources over the past decade or so. It is, quote, what happens when people most often on social media but increasingly in real life band together and employ shaming tactics to block a person from having a platform. It can mean boycotting a target's business, refusing to consume their books or films, or pressuring friends, colleagues, and activists to denounce them or formally cut ties with them. Cancel culture is a cultural response to racist, sexist, anti-Semitic, 
or otherwise offensive or damaging actions, words, behaviors, and choices made by an individual, group, or corporate entity. These descriptors come from an article from religionnews.com. I'm going to back off a little bit on the stop and go with all the references because everything's going to be in the show notes and I am making a more concerted effort to make sure that those show notes are available when the show drops. We say Sunday, it usually drops late Saturday night so that people can wake up to it on Sunday. And I'm just going to make sure that those notes are there. You can check the sources when I'm quoting directly. I'll let you know. But I want to try and keep the flow going with this a little bit. All the references are going to be there. Moving right along. Cancel culture is also described, and this is this is the more modern way of looking at it. It's also described as the effort to erase history, an aspect that has been the subject of much debate, some bordering on violence, particularly over the 45th presidential administration, now happily in the past. For several years, politicians and political commentators like Robert Reich were calling not just for the impeachment and removal of the sitting president, but a nullification of the entire presidency. This would nullify every policy, executive order, and appointment made by that president. It would have turned back the clock in ways that would open up several seats on the Supreme Court, as well as a number of legal appointments installed to steer American politics as far right as possible. Now, most are settling for 45 simply not being allowed to hold public office again in the future. Notice how I'm not using his name again. Yeah. We're going back to that. Mm -hmm. In short, they want to try to cancel any bid for another presidential run by him using various legal channels to ensure disqualification from nomination. So that's a form of it. The idea of canceling certain things, sometimes, not always, but sometimes it serves the public good. Right. Sometimes things get canceled as a matter of shifting social views. For example, you will never see the movie Song of the South or the original version of Fantasia on Disney+, Plus, and there are good reasons for this. The blatant and unabashed racist portrayal of some of the characters in these films is simply not acceptable in our current social climate. Let me actually back up and just say that it isn't acceptable. You see, right. this is where white male mentality comes into play. Right. I read that and I said to myself, we need to remove a couple of words from that statement. Let's just say that it isn't acceptable. Right. It never was. It was just tolerated when those films were made. Didn't make it right then. It's certainly not right now. And that is why some of that content just isn't there anymore. That's why we saw the retirement, not the cancellation, the retirement of six Dr. Seuss books in the last couple of weeks, too. Because social attitudes have changed. The messaging was wrong then. But now that we understand a little bit better why it was wrong. There's no reason for this content to be out there and teaching children to think right. that way. And this was not a matter of public outcry. They did this on their own. And I think that it was a good decision for the reasons that I just stated. Portrayals of other things like sexism and misogyny have largely disappeared from primetime TV too. Just look at a few episodes of shows like All in the Family, One Day at a Time, and Cheers, and you'll spot some marked differences in the way things like male chauvinism and homosexuality are handled between then and now. Certain episodes of some old shows will never be found in syndication, nor will many of the commercials that were popular between the 1960s and early 1990s. How many times have we heard about ads being pulled after public outcry? I mean, a simple Google search will keep you busy for a while on that one. This is a far from new concept. It's just that it has a name now. Right. I found another good article on a website called wellandgood.com that outlines four distinct types of cancel culture tactics. You have calling in, calling out, boycotting, and canceling. And let's take a look at what each of these entails. Calling in involves dealing with people on an individual level and persuading them to stop making certain statements, posting certain kinds of content to social media and other online platforms, and motivating them to quietly delete some of that content and move on. An example of this, your pastor, let's just say it's your pastor. He catches wind of some social media posts that you've made that fall counter to what he considers to be your personal ideals or more realistically his and the churches that he pastors. Okay. Right. 
That's really more to the point. He calls you into his office, lays out the details, and asks you to remove certain posts or comments. This is usually followed up with admonitions to pray about your attitude and ask God to help you, quote, think better about the choices you make with what you post. Oh, and by the way, if this ever happens to you and your response is anything beyond blocking your pastor, you're doing it wrong. Mm. Okay? I would never, ever, ever, ever let my pastor have that much control over what I do when I am not sitting there in, in the pew in his church. Right. Period. End of story. Then there's the concept of calling out. This is the same as calling in, but it's done publicly. And this is one tiny example. And I'm sure that people listening are going to be thinking of other things in their heads that are going to pop into their minds immediately with this. But just for the sake of example, in 2017, Pepsi released a commercial featuring model Kendall Jenner breezily bridging the gap between protesters and police by offering up a soda. It was criticized and memed all over social media for trivializing BLM demonstrations. As a result, the ad was pulled and an apology was made. And I mean, how many examples of this right. have we seen? There's and not, not just recently either. Like within the last several decades, there have been plenty of these. Then there's boycotting, which, you know, it's a big part of cancel culture, but it's been around way, way right. longer than that term. Boycotting, in case anyone needs a definition for this, is encouraging people to stop patronizing businesses or brands that engage in activities that go counter to the accusers or group of accusers' personal morals, ethics, and ideals. Then there's the concept of just flat-out canceling. This is the deliberate attempt to ruin the reputation of an individual, even to the point of them losing their livelihood or ability to safely interact in public as a response to actions words, or behaviors deemed socially harmful. Names like Roseanne and Kelly Griffin and Matt Lauer and Kevin Spacey and Gina Carano came very, very quickly to mind when I was thinking about this one. It can also refer to brands and trademarks like Aunt Jemima, Uncle Remus, and most recently Pepe Le Pew. Right. Now, you know, I'm, I grew up watching Pepe Le Pew. Right. And learned absolutely nothing about how to how to approach and, and deal with women. There's well, no. yeah, That's... there's there's a lot going on there. Right. I mean it was fine for the voulez vous coucher avec moi as a soi generation, but we've gotten past that. Yeah. We're really past that. And I mean I hadn't thought about Pepe Le Pew in years. Right. Because I'm it's been a long time since I actually watched Looney Tunes. But the more I thought about that, the more sense it made Yeah, to see this happen, especially in the wake of things like the Me Too movement. Right. So, you know, society does kind of move in its own line with its own ebb and flow. And then things just sort of get picked up in the surf. And Pepe Le Pew was one of the things that got picked up. And honestly, I can't say that I disagree with this one. Right. I no. feel like, you know, from, from the standpoint of someone who is almost 50 years old and grew up with it. There's that part of my brain that says this is largely innocuous, but then there's a much bigger part of my brain that says, well, Pepe Le Pew was teaching men this is how you deal with women around the same time that a lot of these people that are being called out in the Me Too movement were right. doing what they were doing. So it's time for society to stop saying that this is okay. And that's why you're seeing the outcry over Pepe Le Pew. Right. Now, let's look at the concept of boycotting in a little bit more comprehensive sort of way. Like I said before, boycotts are not new. And the word is really one of the most weaponized terms out there. Here's where this whole thing began. The boycott was popularized by Charles Stuart Parnell during the Irish land agitation of 1880 to protest high rents and land evictions. The term boycott was coined after Irish tenants followed Parnell's suggested code of conduct and effectively ostracized a British estate manager by the name of Charles Cunningham Boycott. So I was like this week years old when I learned that that was actually somebody's <laughs> name and it wasn't just a term that, that was made up. Yep. But it does revolve around one individual just like chauvinism yeah. revolves around one individual. There's, there's so many examples of that. But let's take a look at just a few famous boycotts that have happened over the years. The one that I just mentioned was also referred to as the Captain Boycott. Then you had, before the term boycott existed, 
there was a situation in Great Britain during the French and Indian War where Britain decided that the way to recover its losses was to impasse taxes on the colonies with the Stamp Act. The colonies didn't like that idea and were especially offended by their lack of representation during the decision-making, leading to the slogan, no taxation without representation. So that was one of the earliest examples of a boycott. They fought back by boycotting British goods and rebels started terrorizing British stamp agents into resigning. This desire for autonomy led to further revolts and eventually the American Revolution. So the American Revolution began with a boycott. Mm -hmm. Was it successful? Well, the act was repealed by George III in 1766 and America got its independence. So, yes. Then there was the Montgomery bus boycott. This is the story of Rosa Parks. Not going to get too far into that. We all know what that story is. But it did spark a boycott. First, there was Joanne Robinson, a civil rights activist who made African-Americans aware that they represented 75% of the Montgomery Bus Company's clientele and organized the Monday boycott whereby all African-Americans refused to ride the buses. It was so successful that the boycott continued for another year, encouraged by Martin Luther King Jr. Carpools were created, African-American taxi drivers charged African-American passengers only a dime, and white employers even took to driving their African-American servants to work. Uh, There's good and bad going on in there, that's for sure. But at the same time, it was successful on December 20th, 1956, Laws requiring segregated buses were declared unconstitutional in Montgomery and across the United States. Fast forward to 1977, Nestle came under fire. When they began a marketing campaign to sell breast milk substitutes to developing countries. How shitty is that? I mean, think about it. And for the reasons that that they state right here in the article, they were accused of contributing to health problems and to the rise of infant mortality. Why? Because, as the boycott pointed out, formula is less healthy than breast milk to begin with. And mothers who were using the formula also didn't have access to the clean water that's necessary to make the formula safe. And also, this stuff was expensive. So when these women ran out of the free samples, they were shit out of luck. That boycott went from 1977 to 1984, and it ended after satisfactory codes and policies were put into place. Back in 88, the UK restarted it, and it is still in effect there. All these years later, it's still in effect. I can remember this one really well, the Summer Olympics of 1980. One of the cool things about this was that the Olympic torch was actually run right down Route 9 in Hyde Park, (laughs) where we used to live. Wow. And our entire school was outside watching the torch go by. It was really neat. I still remember it. But there was some controversy around the Summer Games in 1980. Back then, U.S. President Jimmy Carter called for the United States to boycott the Olympics unless Soviet troops withdrew from Afghanistan. 60 other nations joined in the boycott, with many telling their athletes they weren't allowed to compete. 16 of the nations who supported the boycott also supported their athletes' right to choose. They allowed them to go if they wanted to, as long as they marched under their National Olympic Committee flag and had the Olympic, and had the Olympic anthem played at their award ceremonies. As a result, there was one ceremony where three NOC flags were raised. So... Was that one successful? The USSR didn't withdraw their troops for another eight years, and 13 Soviet allies then boycotted the 1984 Los Angeles Olympics in retaliation. So, no, that was kind of a Mexican standoff, and it didn't really work. I remember this one, too. 1992, I was still in college, but I remember it well. International Buy Nothing Day was instituted in 92, intended as the opposite to Black Friday and a boycott on consumerism. The idea is that people will stop and think about their overconsumption rather than go out and get swept up in the crazy sales. Given that people are still getting injured and arrested in the craziness, it doesn't seem to have worked. I think COVID went further toward quelling some of this. Yeah. Because we may be looking at a second year in a row of no major Black Friday anything. Right. We may be looking at another year of this. And I think that 
the more you push these things out of the cultural norm, the less of a priority they become. Back in the day, it was just a matter of good. You stick it to them and you make sure that Jesus remains the focal point of Christmas and not all of this. (laughs) That was that was my mindset at the time. But this particular one, it's one of those things that had very, very good intentions, but didn't really go very far. No. I'm going to move ahead just a little bit here in 2005. The Abercrombie and Fitch Girl Cot. Oh, I remember this one really, really well. One of my online friends had a daughter who was very into Abercrombie and Fitch. But when presented with the information about this, she literally, she didn't even want to donate these clothes. She literally got rid of a large portion of her wardrobe and said, yeah, no more of that. But it all began with a new line of girls' t-shirts that was introduced with slogans that were considered to be offensive and harmful, mostly to body image, such as who needs brains when you have these and the freshman 15 with a list of names under it. And then there's, there's a graphic right here with some of the other ones. I had a nightmare. I was a brunette. Yeah. Do I make you look fat? No money, no car, no chance. There was major outcry over this that I remember well. And the successfulness of it, it's kind of a toss-up. Five days of protests got the girls behind the boycott, a meeting at the corporate headquarters, and a month later, the shirts were gone. The article speculates that that could just be because they ran out of stock. Yeah, right. But we don't know. The shirts disappeared. So it's a maybe sort of win. Right. In the interest of not spending the entire episode on this, because none of this has anything to do with evangelical anything, but it goes to prove that this is something that has been around for a long time and it has varying degrees of success. Right. It all depends on what the cause is and the people who are behind it. That's what makes it successful, what makes it a failure or anything in between. It has to do with the brevity of the situation and the commitment of the people behind protesting it. The next tactic in cancel culture is also a very, very big one, and that is the concept of calling out. Now, this concept is also not at all new. Politicians have used it throughout history to besmirch the reputations of their opponents, and I can think about listening to some of the debates from way back, like presidential campaigns from like the 1800s. These things were savage. Oh, yeah. Oh, these these people pulled no punches. They spoke their mind like 100%. They didn't worry about hurting anybody's feelings, and there was no such thing as political correctness, okay? If they wanted to smear you, they just smeared you. And it went beyond politics, but that's like the biggest platform for this sort of thing until a little bit more recently. But we see examples of this every time there's some bombshell scandal that emerges weeks or days before an election. We've even seen it right here in our town and local politics and in some of the surrounding towns. We've seen the same type of thing happen where just before an election, oh yeah, here's something you really ought to know about your candidate. But one of the great grandparents of cancel culture was a little thing called the McCarthy hearings. This was little more than a political witch hunt designed to target high-profile celebrities who were either believed or reported to be communists or operating under communist influence, and the goal of this was basically to wreck their careers. Many people, including Arthur Miller, saw distinct parallels between the McCarthy hearings and another historical calling out hysteria, the Salem Witch Trials. Calling out was an American thing before America was officially a thing. And Arthur Miller saw the parallels between the Salem witch trials and Joe McCarthy's tireless quest to unearth communist activity in American society, particularly among celebrities. But as destructive as the McCarthy hearings could have been, and in many ways were, the way cancel culture operates today is even more dangerous. An op-ed by Ken Oler in the Wall Street Journal put it this way, quote, where the threshold for condemnation in the McCarthy era was alleged affiliation with communist sympathizers, sufficient unto us today is the mere failure to publicly join in the denunciation of the latest societal construct or historical figure to be branded as racist, fascist, sexist, homophobic, etc. In other words, if you're not for us, you're against us and subsequently guilty by association. Mm-hmm. 
I have to wonder just how many Christians have been going to church every Sunday since last March, have opted out of wearing a mask, particularly at church, but also in other places, or have been called in or called out for guarding their personal safety during the pandemic and shamed for their lack of faith. Mm. I wonder how many pastors have been guilty of this, particularly those intimidating, close the door behind you kind of meetings that you never want to find yourself in with anyone. But what does this have to do with cancel culture? Well, it has everything to do with cancel culture, and here's how. In one of the most dangerous spins I've ever seen on this, we now have pastors and church leaders literally putting people's lives at risk, using the fear of being called out or called in as a weapon to perpetuate their very wrong assertions that COVID-19 isn't a real threat and that acknowledging it as such demonstrates an unacceptable lack of faith. And it doesn't end with shaming. Oh, no. And we're not just talking about COVID. We're talking about anything that you do or say that these people don't like. And it certainly doesn't end with a closed door meeting with the pastor. I mean, think about some of these scenarios. I'm sorry, Dan, but we've decided to go with another contractor to finish the baptismal. All because they didn't like something Dan said or did maybe on social media or the fact that he's adamant about wearing his mask. Yeah. Greta, I'm afraid our school can't have someone on staff who instills fear in children by wearing masks all day when she ought to be teaching them to place their trust in God. How about when a pastor texts his entire board and tells them that the church wishes to boycott a congregant's business over differences of opinion regarding COVID or anything else? These things happen, and they are happening. And just to put a little bit more of a cap on that, here are some of the things that evangelicals have been trying to cancel for years, years longer, sometimes much longer. Science, I think that goes without saying. Any flavor of Christianity that isn't their favorite, and this goes in multiple directions because I think I told this story once before on the show about how there was a little bit of overlap between my involvement with the Catholic Church and evangelical Christianity. I had already been to a few youth group meetings and a few church services at a Pentecostal church, and I was in the process of preparing for confirmation. And I confided, for whatever reason, I don't even remember why the conversation was happening in the first place, I had confided some of the things that had been going on. And one of the things that this person asked me was whether or not I had taken communion at this church. And at that point, I hadn't. And she said, well, that's a good thing because that would have been a mortal sin. So you see, it goes in both ways. Any flavor of Christianity that the other guy doesn't like has to be bad. And, and sometimes they take it to the nth degree, saying that if you eat this communion wafer, then you need to go to confession, like now, right. because you are in danger of going to hell. It can get that extreme. They like the idea of canceling popular music. I think about the Satanic Panic and Gary Greenwald, Rock a Bye Bye Baby, yeah. and all of that bullshit that culminated with a bunch of people at every place, every place he stopped along the way, they did a bonfire yeah. where kids were burning all of their quote unquote satanic music. Yeah. And it goes back further than that. Elvis, the Beatles, the Doors, they all had their share of controversies and they all had churches uprising against what they had to say, how they did things. It was a mess and it started long before the quote unquote satanic panic in the 80s. <laughs> And jazz. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Jazz, Tin Pan Alley, anything that was not church music. True, but you also have to consider um, who were most jazz musicians. Yeah. It There's wasn't as much that. a jab at the music as it was at the people making the music. True that. Mm -hmm. Then you have popular movies. I mean, I can remember this one really well. I want to say this was probably 10th grade for me, somewhere in that neighborhood when The Last Temptation of Christ came out. And boy, was I on the warpath against that movie. Yeah. But another thing that I remember about that was that I even tried to start a boycott over that movie. And it really went nowhere. I mean, even among some of the most dyed-in-the-wool evangelicals I knew... I could not persuade anyone to sign this petition that had been going around. And I didn't write the petition. 
I just got access to it and was trying to get more signatures on it. And looking back, I think the issue was with the verbiage of yeah. the petition where it basically threatened that if you show this movie, we're never going to patronize your business again. And that was a little bit too much. Yeah, for, a little bit. E- even in an environment where you're discouraged from going to the movies. I found a lot of pushback from people saying, well, I'm not going to sign my name to something and say that I'm not going to patronize a business when I know that I will again. So I'm going to take a pass on this. That was one little crusade of mine that was very, very short lived. And yes, it was just a little bit extreme. How about canceling books? Nazism, anyone? I mean, I hate to bring up the bleeding obvious here. But Nazism was based on interpretations of Christian morals, ethics, and doctrines. Right. So the notion of getting rid of any kind of book that was deemed subversive, which was pretty much most of them yeah. out there. I mean, I've seen pictures of the bonfires, not just movies where they've been portrayed. These were real things. These things happened. Yeah. And a lot of of literature just well not necessarily the titles themselves because there were always other copies but what it all represented and what they were trying to do and what they were trying to say about other people's words that somehow disagreed with theirs was very telling and i was told on numerous occasions as a young evangelical that it was not a good idea to read secular novels yeah it was too late. I was already into Stephen King and was <laughs> for a long time and didn't really talk about it at youth group. Well, no. But I also never stopped reading the books. Then there's the cancellation of free thought. I mean, this has never, this has never been a friend of Christianity. Free no. thought and Christianity, oh, they will never mesh. There is oil and water as they come. The Catholic Church used to literally tell people not to read the Bible. This is my grandmother would tell me this that she was told not to read the Bible because only a priest who had been trained in interpreting it could even begin to explain what was going on in it. They managed to make people feel too stupid to read words from the manual of their own faith. I mean, can you imagine being told as a Christian not to read the Bible? Yeah. It's like, no, we'll read it to you on Sunday. Just come to Mass, we'll read it to you on Sunday. You know, we'll tell you what you need to know. And let's not forget the whole concept of every thought and captivity that you see in 2 Corinthians 10, 5. So right. they didn't want you to read the Bible. They just wanted to tell you what it said because if you got to reading it on your own, you might figure out the plethora of places and ways that they were full of shit. Yeah. How about canceling democracy? And mm-hmm. don't you dare tell me that that's not what this whole business was about back in January. Oh, yeah. These people tried hard to cancel our last election in case anyone has managed to forget about that they want theocratic rule or at very least a leader who will give them what they want along any conceivable line and remove anything from society that makes them uncomfortable or goes counter to what they believe right so if that is not an attempt to cancel democracy i don't know what is I don't even think I need to get into details about their efforts to cancel things like alternative lifestyles, abortion, and civil rights. And in the case of those last three, the cancel train has gained enough steam to manifest a plethora of hate groups whose actions have been morally reprehensible, but which they believe are righteous, the organizations and the people who adhere to them and support them. We could go on with this all night, but the simple truth of the matter is that Christians, evangelicals in particular, have gone and continue to go on countless cancellation crusades over any person or thing that makes them feel even remotely uncomfortable. When it comes to being offended, no other people group does it with the vigor, zeal, and flamboyancy of evangelicals. And I mean, it was even a point of jokes yes when we were in college just the sheer number of things that people found to be offended by or just scared of yes demon under every rock oh yeah but that's a big part of it though right is the fear factor we try to push things out of our way that make us uncomfortable or make us fearful or make us doubt what other people are telling us that we should think so that's a big part of it but i think that in a large majority of those cases of things that I heard people being offended about in school, they were grabs for attention yeah. more than anything else. And it was just a way of these people trying 
to feel more in control of things. Yeah. When we talk about things that offend them and the flamboyancy with which they go after them, how about just the name of a rock band? Kiss. Anyone who's any even close to our age is going to hear that name and the term knights in Satan's service yeah. is going to come directly to mind. And I believed it. And it was a point of fear. I was a young kid at that point, And a lot of my friends, a lot of my friends were into Kiss. But I was fearful of them mm. because of this and because of the makeup. Yeah. Okay. I was pretty young. In I think that they started doing their thing in 76, which would have put me for most of that year at four years old. Yeah. So, yeah, when you've got people around you telling you that this means this and you've grown up in a Catholic household so you know who the devil is. Yeah. Okay. These kinds of thoughts get put in your mind. And not only are you told that they have demonic influences, they fucking look like demons. And that was most of the, I think that was most of the point. It was supposed to be over the top and flamboyant. But how about the Procter and Gamble thing during the satanic panic? I mean, I talked in depth about this in episode 13 when we talked about the satanic panic. There was a video that hit YouTube a few years ago now. This is going back a while. Yeah. Where this lunatic of an evangelical woman whose expression never changes through the course of this entire video, it's almost like she's an android. And she's explaining this and never any real inflection in her voice, but it sounds very, very, very rehearsed. And she starts going through all of the imagery on this can of monster. Yes. This monster energy drink. The allegation there is that the M in monster represents 666 because it also is the same shape as one of the Hebrew letters yeah. with the value of six. And since there's three of them, there's 666. The T in monster looks more like a cross. Yeah. And one of the things that she brought up about that is that when you turn the can over now it's an upside down cross and here's her tagline bottoms up and satan laughs Jeez. wow it's a lot and i'm like boy you thought about this way too much yeah and there were other things too she's pointing out all kinds of shit yeah. on this can that you know it didn't mean anything were there hidden meanings behind it you know some of it maybe there was but it didn't mean that you were that you were guzzling Satan. Okay? No, no, <laughs> no. Um, and the funny thing about that, like very shortly after I saw that video, and had a good guffaw over that, just how how deadpan she was and how deathly serious she was. We got a Keurig, yeah, for Christmas like a few years ago, and one of the things that I noticed yeah. when I was cleaning this thing. Was that right there on the base, there yeah. is what I would definitely consider to be a legit pentagram. Okay. Yeah. Little star in a circle right there in the middle of the thing. Yes. So I'm thinking, when is this woman going to come back with a video about Keurig? Yeah, right. How you're putting your cup down on this little altar <laughs> with the pentagram and filling your cup with Satan. Oh, my. <laughs> oh, that is pretty good, though. Yeah, and I remember also thinking about how Poe's Law would have come yeah. into play with that if I had decided to do some kind of parody video, because it was in my head oh, to sure. do a parody video, but I was literally afraid that it would start getting spread over social media and people would take me seriously. Right. Like so, some people take the Babylon Bee seriously, and it's like, oh God, the it's Babylon a parody Bee. site. Yeah, but... I mean, you see that with The Onion, too. Yeah. How many of our evangelical friends, I mean, what happened more than once, mm -hmm. sent us that article about Harry Potter. Yes. From The like, Onion. When The Onion is your main source, you got to take a second look at your life. True. True. Very true. And, I mean, you also have to get yourself a little crash course on the concept of satire. Yeah. Because these things are very, very, very very clearly satirical and by the time this thing started getting passed around people knew what the onion was no, it's yeah. one of the first internet sites that i can remember visiting 
right. was the onion. I got to tell you, Landover Baptist Church <laughs> is a better one. Yeah. It, I spent, because I think we were evangelicals at the time, I spent several years trying to figure out whether or not they were legit. Yeah. Because nothing there seemed too outlandish to be legit. Yeah. That's the crazy part. We're in the middle of this thing and we still can't tell. Right. Because, I mean, it seemed reasonably normal. I mean, there were certain things that looking back on it, Betty Bowers, America's Best Christian. Let's yeah. Let's think about this just a little bit. There were always these questions in my mind. Are these people for real? And... It took a couple of years, but doing a little bit more digging and really seeing what they were into and actually reading some of the stuff that didn't get passed around like on Usenet. It wasn't even social media at that point. It was no. like it, it was, was platforms Usenet. like Usenet that had all of this stuff out there. And if all you ever did was click the links that people posted on Usenet, you didn't get the entire story. Right. But it is very clear that Landover Baptist was and is a parody website. And Betty Bowers is still out there. There's oh, all yeah. kinds of stuff that they still produce. And it's funny as fuck. But you got to make sure that you understand that it is, in fact, satire. Right. It's just not that far off, <laughs> which is kind of scary. Yeah. But it also makes it funnier. Getting back to the subject of things that offend Christians. You know, I endured more instances of the term I'm offended just in college to get me through literally my entire life. Ugh, yeah. Um, yeah, it constantly amazed me. The kinds of things people got up in arms over, including some of the entertainment at the student center. So here comes one of my famous Valley Farce stories. We had movies at the student center canceled after a few people complained about us showing Star Wars movies because, quote, it romanticizes New Age ideology. And also because the wrong person showed up at the wrong time and heard Marty McFly say, Jesus Christ, Doc, you disintegrated Einstein. Yeah. So that was the end of Back to the Future. That and the small handful of other swear words that you hear in that movie. <laughs> I mean, forgiving the fact that any of us that went to public high school were hearing worse on the bus on the way to school. Right. We couldn't have that in our little jesus -y cloister. So one of the deans, this was the dean of student life, one of the biggest smarm boxes you would ever want to meet, one of the biggest dicks I have ever met in my entire life, bar none. I even, and hey, if you're listening, this was me on that card that everybody signed for you. I'm the one that wrote good luck in prison because it sure as fuck looked like that's where you were heading. So... Yeah, that was me. 30 years later, true confessions, take my degree away, I don't give a fuck. But the dean of student life shows up at the student center. And I'm working at the student center at this point. This is my gig. So I'm there and getting ready to open for the night. And this guy just waltzes in and demands that I hand over the VCR. And he takes it out and he proclaims very, very loudly that... Only Christian entertainment and approved secular TV shows would be allowed to be shown in the student center going forward. I actually had to make a list of shows and a list of movies and get them approved before we could actually show them in the student center. So we went from watching cool movies like Back to the Future to watching a lot of cartoons mm. and stuff that was geared more toward children or whenever somebody showed up with a Christian movie, right. there was leniency for that if it came from a credible source. So we had a couple of friends that had a bunch of videos, and I had a few myself. So we started watching, like, Charlie Peacock concert videos and yeah. whatnot. And we had there, – there was a bunch of other stuff. We had Striper live in Japan. That was mine. We <laughs> had a couple of Petra videos. So – it turned into more of a, a Christian music fest for a little while there until things started to die down a little bit. We got our VCR back. They started re relaxing the rules a little bit more. And all of a sudden, you're walking into the student center at dinner time and you can actually watch Star Trek TNG. So yeah. there was that, which actually really surprises me because there's a lot of atheistic and humanistic content in that show yeah. and not a whole lot of theistic content that is also painted in a good light. So, 
you know, there is there is that. But you know what? I think that it just boiled down to the pot was over boiling. It's now down to a simmer. It's cooling down. Maybe we can try this again. Yeah. And I do recall toward the end there, more mainstream movies showing back up at the student center. They actually allowed us to show Ghost. Don't ask me why. Wow. Okay. Um, I think it's because you got to see a couple people dragged to hell and they wanted to make the point clear. I, that's, <laughs> that's all I can think of. Yeah, that would make sense. Yeah, but that wasn't the last time the student center would come under scrutiny. Someone managed to complain about a couple of the video games downstairs and I showed up one day and the cute little arcade that we had down there was now maybe two or three game machines. We had Tetris. We had some kind of racing game. But there was nothing really cool down there for a while, and then that came back, too. I'm amazed that we never lost the pool tables, because what are the connotations with that, you know? (laughs) I'm frankly amazed that we didn't lose the pool tables, because, I mean, another thing that happened was that we had a group of students who liked to play cards, and there was a large group of students that had gathered at the student center pretty much nightly to play cards. Not for money. They were just playing card games. It wasn't yeah. like poker no. or anything like that. I forget Probably what the name of this... like uh Oh, I know what it was. Shoot. Pitch. I remember hearing names like Pitch yeah. and Cassine yeah. was another one. I, you know, I don't know what these things are. I them. never played them. They were a bunch of like... Probably old-timey card games that their grandfathers taught them. Right, right. I mean, I'm pretty sure that there were a few rounds of Go Fish in there, too. Yeah, of course. Um, But they liked playing card games, and they bonded over these games. There was like seven or eight of them. And then all of a sudden, the morality police show up and say, no, you can't do that. There are people that don't like the connotation of playing cards because it's associated with gambling. And there are some people who even associate them with black magic which i can see to a certain yeah. extent because the tarot and and a basic deck of 52 cards do have a lot of similarities yeah and you can fortune tell with playing cards oh totally I you totally just have to, to assign that, but... the values that right. would be on the tarot card to the playing card i get all of that but still they were playing yeah. a fucking game yeah Give me just a small break no i and, get it and you know I, there was there was so much more i got called i got called in numerous times by RAs and administrators over things that I said and did, particularly defending showing movies at the Student Center. And don't forget how I was called in over my shoes. I remember you talking about that when it happened. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I think when we did our Bible College episodes, I went through this. So just as a brief recap, there was an RA at Valley Farce that did not like the shoes that I was wearing. Because I was wearing black Reeboks, I have orthopedic issues. I've had a bunch of surgeries. And walking around all day in dress shoes was not something that I was ever going to be able to do. Well, he didn't like that I was able to bend the rules, so he decided he was going to make trouble over it. So, ostensibly, they wanted to cancel my privilege to wear orthopedically necessary footwear just as a means of getting me to comply with their rules. Right. That was it. That was most of it. It was a physiological thing. It wasn't a rebellion thing. I wasn't wearing black Reeboks just as a fuck you. I was wearing black Reeboks because my feet and my very horribly hammered toes would not sit in dress shoes all day. My feet would be hamburger. Yeah. Okay. I would not be able to do it. And I certainly wouldn't have been able to do it for four years. Yeah. So this was the solution. I got black sneakers that masqueraded as dress shoes so it didn't look like I was walking around campus in tennies, even though there were a couple of other students who did just that and didn't seem to be harassed over it. But I also don't know what their RAs did because that's that's the whole concept of calling in is it's more of a behind closed doors thing. So who knows? Who knows what conversations happened? between these other people and the powers that were in that place. But I know for me, it wasn't an act of rebellion. It was just a simple fact of, if I'm going to walk around this campus, then I need to be able to walk. Right. I mean, that was really what it boiled down to. So, of course, they failed to get me to put on the dress shoes. They didn't like it. And that RA then spent 
weeks, literally weeks, following me around. I fucking saw him everywhere. Yeah. Looking for new dirt to dig up on me. And, of course, I didn't give him anything. Right. Because, I mean, at the end of the day, I wasn't there to rouse rabble. I was there to get my education and embark on my calling. That was all I ever wanted out of that place. But, boy, oh, boy, did they give me more. Mm -hmm. And, boy, did they give me more to think about later on in life. Getting back to one of the earlier sources that I'm drawing from tonight, an article from religiousnews.com, just want to take a look at some of the things that they have to say and comment on them. Through the 1980s and 90s, church youth groups coordinated book burnings and music bonfires to purge their world of evil art. Mm -hmm. And yeah, good old Gary Greenwald taught us how to do that. Mm -hmm. On any given night of the week, televangelists and Christian activists could be found on cable news attacking their enemies by name and blaming them for the moral decay of America. Evangelicals try their level best to smear and shame any person or organization who doesn't behave or believe in ways that make them feel comfortable. The goal, of course, is to not just change minds, but create an entire society that functions in every way, socially, legally, and politically, according to their Christian values. They do have a big voice in politics, but not as much in other areas, and it frustrates the shit out of them that they don't have a bigger voice in those areas. But let's look at just some of the things they pulled in just the past few decades. The 1970s saw the earliest iterations of the religious right and religious leaders like Jerry Falwell Sr. were key players in the infiltration of American politics and the intended steering of America in the direction of Christian values. And I'm going to read this just as it's written in the article because I can't say it better. Quote, Beginning in the 1970s, a group of Southern Baptists led by now-disgraced preacher and seminary president Paige Patterson and other conservative leaders sought to purge their denomination of any hint of liberal theology. Seminary professors, church employees, and pastors lost their jobs or were shamed out of the convention during this denominational civil war. Known as the conservative resurgence or the fundamentalist takeover, depending on your point of view, the coup Patterson led was a massive exercise of cancel culture. Only true believers allowed. Anyone who crossed the masses was expelled quickly and forcefully. Beyond the SBC, one of the best known examples of evangelical cancel culture involved the public shaming of author Rob Bell, a former megachurch pastor who dared to question whether non-Christians went to hell after they died. Strictly, Bell was not canceled, but farewelled. The patent online move was simply to bid farewell Rob Bell next to a link to his apostasy. Suddenly, anyone who was friends with Bell, owned books by Bell, or even dared to quote Bell's earlier work was at risk of being canceled as well. Just let that sink in for a little bit. Now we're going to move a little bit further down the timeline here. This is the stuff that I remember. This is the stuff that still sticks in my mind like it happened yesterday. We already discussed the satanic panic and the war on secular movies and TV. That was much of the 80s, and I bought into a lot of it. Moralism and legalism were well established by the time I set foot on Word of Life Island in 1985, and even I had heard names like Jerry Falwell and the Moral Majority, even though I had no clue who or what they were until I was a little bit older. Evangelicals love to boycott things, and this is, I think, the 1980s and forward is where a lot of the modern examples come from. I mean, there were plenty from earlier, but we're talking real major public eye stuff here. Things that started happening in the about mid 80s. So like 1985, there were multiple examples of scandals among televangelists that led to the cancellation, there's that word again, of affiliation with the Assemblies of God and other Pentecostal organizations making their churches and affiliations hostile territory to the likes of Jimmy Swaggart and Jim Baker. Both found themselves without an adequate support base or affiliation with any religious organization and had to rebrand independently to keep doing what they were doing. 
Popular media even tried calling out multiple megachurch pastors over their opulent lifestyles. This started in the 80s, and it just kept going and going right. and going. And it is, to this day, an ongoing effort that seems to have little effect among those who are bound and determined to follow the chicanery of preachers like Robert Tilton, Billy Sunday, Gene Scott, and any and all word faith preachers alive or dead. That's right, some of these people have been dead for years, and their foundations still get insane numbers of contributions from their faithful, with literally nothing to show for the money that they invest. And these organizations aren't exactly making their books public either. 1997, we saw the Southern Baptist Convention, an organization of 16 million people, call for the boycott of Disney properties and products owing to their welcoming attitude toward gays, lesbians, and other people of alternative lifestyles. Oh, I remember that real well. Yeah. But yeah, you know what? That. I also know a lot of evangelicals that go to Disney World like every year, multiple times a year if they live in Florida. Yep. So, yeah, good job with that, that one. Very well. Didn't work very well. <laughs> They're still alive and kicking and doing pretty damn well financially. I'll leave it up to the individual listener to decide whether or not that's a good thing. Um, 1999, Jerry Falwell led an effort to boycott the Teletubbies. I remember this one, too. Yep. Oh, my God. Asserting that Tinky Winky was gay. And I'm like, he's a weird anthropomorphized color. That's all he was. I mean, that's all any of them were. Yeah. It, I don't understand how people can be so up in arms because he carries a purse. He carried a bag. It was a red purse. Okay. But it was basically a bag. And it's like, you don't know what this thing is. Plenty it's of men, a thing. Plenty of men carry side bags. Yes. And this has been a thing since probably, I want to say at least the, uh, the mid-70s. At least. I can remember seeing them when I was a kid. Oh, yeah. And no, it wasn't a purse. It certainly didn't look like a purse. No. It certainly looked masculine. This thing... It was cartoonish and caricaturish, so maybe it looks a little bit more like a purse. But, but a man who carries a purse is not necessarily gay. No. It was beyond silly, and the attention that it got, even still being in the thick of all of that, I sat there scratching my head, thinking to myself, well, who gives a fuck? Yeah. I mean, little children are not going to be looking at it from that perspective, and I really don't think that they're learning how to be gay by watching the Teletubbies. No. So, again, who gives a fuck? Now we're going to move forward in time another 13 years, 2012. Now you've got one million moms, of which there was nowhere near, led by the AFA, the American Family Association. Yeah. Which is a recognized hate group through the Southern, through the Southern Poverty Law Center. Yeah. Getting better at saying it, but I did trip over it once. Um but they let a boycott of J.C. Penney for hiring Ellen DeGeneres as their spokesperson. Well, what was Ellen's crime? She's a lesbian. Mm. So we can't have a lesbian selling us clothes and wares and anything else that J.C. Penney wants to throw at us, can we? And that, yeah. that we can't have that. So these one million moms, of which there were probably more like a tenth, <laughs> decided that they were going to go on their little witch hunt over Ellen DeGeneres. And in recent years, Christian writers, including Jen Hatmaker and Rachel Held Evans, have found their books no longer welcome in Christian bookstores due to their support for same-sex marriage. Yeah, I was just I was just remembering too. Um, remember when they told us to stop listening to Amy Grant and oh, Sandy yeah. Patty? Yes, because they got divorced. Mm -hmm. They both got divorced. Right. And right. that was the only reason. Yeah. It the, was the, the radio late station 80s that I worked at. and early 90s. Mm -hmm. where well, actually, it was a little bit later because I know that it was into the 90s at this point. Because yeah. I was working in Christian radio. And I can remember, at least for a brief period, it came back. Yeah. But for a brief period, they pulled all of Sandy Patty's stuff. Yeah. And that was in response to her divorce. Now, you said you had another story that you wanted to tell. Well, that was tell. a Valley Forge story. That's fine. Okay. What was it again? During my first year of college, we had a class called Achieving Collegiate Excellence or Academic Excellence. I forget the exact name, but we also had a book that goes with it. And it was, you know, just a book of all of the different techniques you could use to help you deal with 
college classes Mm -hmm. and studying and becoming a good student, you know, and there's also the sections of the book that had to deal with mind body. Right. Like, you know, making sure you get enough exercise, making sure you get enough sleep, all of these things. And the emblem before each of these sections was a man or a person in a lotus position with their hands resting on their knees inside a triangle, inside a circle. Oh, dear God. And of course, like every single, like, like there were a bunch of students who complained, not to their parents. They complained to their pastors, a lot of whom contributed money to Valley Forge. Yeah, we can see where this is going. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, they eventually just canceled that book right out of our class. They even gave us refunds at the school store for them. That's amazing. I know, right? And it's just sort of like, okay, but... They gave money back. They, I, yeah, that was... that. Wow. Looking back, that is kind of a stunner. Mm-hmm. But they had to... I mean, didn't they have to go through some procedure when they chose a book for this class? I mean, didn't they look at these books before they chose them? It's like, or did they just choose it? Highly unlikely. Think about, think about the people that ran that place. Think about the atmosphere that we were in. Do you honestly think that they vetted this stuff? Yeah. At least vetted it adequately to know that this is something that they wanted in their curriculum? No. Yeah. No. And and then, you know, now looking back, too, I'm like, okay, the people who are in charge of this particular class were not regular teachers. They were gym teachers. <laughs> Ladies, gym <laughs> teachers. God. It was like, oh my. now I'm looking back and I'm like, they probably just looked through an academic catalog and picked a random book because it had a red cover or something. Mm-hmm. They probably picked the one that had the brightest cover. Right. And said, oh, this one will be fine. And didn't bother to look in it. But they misunderstood their students are going to actually look at this frigging book. Well, <laughs> some. See... Yes. Yeah, I mean, I, I had friends in college that prided themselves on never buying a single textbook and getting like A's and B's. Because well, I mean, there was there was no challenge to well, no. the curriculum in that place. No. If you went to class and you took notes, then you were going to be fine. Yeah. I knew people who rarely actually purchased textbooks and graduated with decent grades. That's that's how useful yeah. those textbooks actually were. And yeah, there's a lot of infighting. There's an incredible amount of infighting within the confines of evangelical Christianity. And that's just one example yeah. where people are all up in arms over a textbook at their Christian college. So first they go after society and then they go after each other. But guess what? Now society is coming for them. People, I want you to hear this and I want you to hear it well. Don't give evangelicals too much power inside your head, whether you are one of them or whether you are on the outside looking in and hearing the media telling you about the major threat that these people are. I'm not going to downplay their numbers and their strength in numbers, but don't give them too much power. They taught society how to think in these terms, how to do cancel culture. This is largely on them, at least in a contemporary setting. It is largely on them. And guess what? Now it's starting to turn on them. One of the more popular doctrines within Christianity is the notion of reaping what you sow. Some describe it as what goes around comes around. Some invoke the term karma for this. But the point is that it isn't a specifically Christian concept, and it does prove true more often than not. Like I've said before, there is no such thing as sin, only actions and consequences. Evangelicals have been trying to sear the cancel culture mindset into its adherence for more than a century, and the roots of those efforts run even deeper and reach further back into history. Okay, you want your entire country thinking like this? You've got it. Now prepare to reap the whirlwind. No matter how it looked, the election of our 45th president was a catalyst for an upsurge of righteous anger toward the types of things that evangelicals have been trying for decades to cancel, and now it is working against them. We already mentioned a few Christian authors whose books disappeared from Christian bookstores, but even more are disappearing from platforms like Amazon. When Harry became Sally, 
by Ryan Anderson is an example. But something clearly shifted within the past five years, and I'm not the only one who sees it, because this comes from another one of the articles that you'll find in the show notes. The rapidly proliferating groups evangelicals have been marginalizing and attacking. Women, people of color, feminists, immigrants, LGBTQ people, just to name a few, recognized that they had their own pulpits on social media and they began to sermonize back. Mm -hmm. Um, Guys, you taught us your game and we're going to play it. Yeah. You just got Rick rolled. (laughs) We know your game and we're going to play. Chris Hodges, senior pastor of the Highlands, an evangelical congregation with 60,000 members spread across 24 locations. My God, it's a fucking franchise. Came under fire after screenshots were shared online showing the pastor liking several posts by Charlie Kirk, a controversial pro-Trump activist. You see his name got in there anyway. The posts in question were considered racially insensitive and, among other things, questioned whether white privilege actually exists. Spoiler alert, it exists. These actions sparked outcry from Birmingham residents, including the pastor of at least one black church, who was already displeased that Hodges Church had been planting white congregations in black neighborhoods to which they had no connection. Hodges attempted to quell the furor by deleting his social media accounts and tearfully apologizing to his congregation, but Birmingham's Board of Education, which leased two public high schools to the church, was unconvinced. And this is standard response, either from within or outside evangelicalism. We'll get to the rest of that story in a little while. The scripted, well-acted, meticulously worded mea culpa and actions that corroborate the words are a big thing in cancel culture that's supposed to fix everything but it doesn't and most people don't buy it when it's offered i mean it almost always comes across as very scripted and not very sincere the whole business with chris hodges ended with them losing those properties so that's two churches basically that didn't have homes anymore because of what he said on social media So the community that was renting him these spaces decided to cancel him. Yeah. And with all due respect, I think that it was a good decision. I think that anytime a church closes, it's a good thing. So yay to the folks of Birmingham for stepping up and doing what they did. And all the mea culpas in the world were not going to change any of that. Because one thing that I've learned about cancel culture is that when something gets canceled, it gets canceled. Yeah. And that has been true almost uniformly. I mean, there are exceptions. There are certain things that I've heard of recently that might be reversed in popular media that seemed like they had the doors shut and barred pretty tight. But for the most part, once a person or a corporation or a brand is canceled, it stays canceled. Yeah. And the vilification goes on for quite a while. Right now, evangelicals are backpedaling and trying desperately to distance themselves from anything associated with cancel culture, even to the point of trying to squeeze biblical examples into the, nar- into the narrative and telling other Christians that cancel culture goes against scripture, forgiving the fact that it calls in numerous places for the cancellation of things like family values, women's rights, and alternative lifestyles outright. It pre-cancels things like free thought, scientific thought, mental health care, and much more with its Bronze Age attitudes towards these things. And let's not forget that it was cancel culture mentality that led to the denial of the outcome of our last presidential election and the subsequent attack on our nation's capital. It culminated with far-right-led insurrectionists attempting to halt the verification of electoral college votes and keep their maniacal leader in the Oval Office. Since then, there hasn't been silence, but the volume has been turned down on the subject considerably. Most dialogue about it has retreated back behind the walls of evangelical churches, with a few notable and dangerous exceptions, including things like anti-vaxxing. So now they're being discussed from pulpits and they're being discussed behind closed doors. It's not as much in the public eye, but it is still there. It is still there. It is still visible. And you can find details about all of this stuff anywhere you want. Just be careful where you go. Yeah. As always, just be careful where you get your news. Spoiler alert, social media, not a good place. No. Our country is finally 
coming out from under the thumb of a deadly virus. Another subject of numerous cancellation attempts ranging from masking to vaccines to asserting the right to hold super spreader events. You can attempt to cancel coronavirus all you want, but the only way to actually do it is to listen to the public health and governmental bodies that are saying right things about this and giving good advice and implementing good policy. These are who we need to be listening to and doing what must be done to stop the spread. Even now, the effort to cancel sound health and safety guidelines is in full force, even to the point of some places fully lifting mask mandates. The entire state of Texas is being left unprotected right now as a result of the efforts of cancel culture nutters deciding that people's personal comfort is somehow more important than facilitating public safety. Now, from what I hear, not being able to breathe or being on a respirator is pretty fucking uncomfortable. Mm. And let's also try to remember that when certain companies make decisions about the content they market, these decisions are not necessarily based on pressure from outside sources. Sometimes perceived cancel culture isn't cancel culture. Sometimes you just have to look at the world around you and decide if this is the kind of messaging you as a brand, as a company, as an individual want to be delivering in the current social climate. And again, not that any of this stuff was ever appropriate. Right. But now we understand things a little bit better. We think differently. And that is what led to the quote unquote cancellation of six Dr. Seuss books. They weren't canceled. They were simply discontinued and retired by the foundation that publishes them. Right. The Dr. Seuss Foundation decided that the messaging in these books clashes with A, the social attitudes of our time, and B, the messaging in other examples of its content. Nothing got canceled aside from the idea that racist words and imaging are not the types of things we want to be teaching children. The idea of doing so was canceled with this action. Mm. But the content itself was not. No one called for a boycott. No one tried to get Dr. Seuss books banned from Amazon. It was a decision made from within the organization, and it was, in my opinion, a good one. It also reflects the sentiments about portrayal of race in popular children's media like Peanuts that did come under public scrutiny just recently, within the last few years. I have varying opinions on that whole thing, but I also have to remind myself that I am a white male who has been taught to think like a white male, so... I don't think I have much of a say in anything that involves the portrayal of someone else's race and how their race is portrayed on screen. I don't think that I have a voice in that. So I'm going to shut up about it. If it offends someone, if it offends someone, they have a right to their say and to make calls to action to steer social attitudes away from detrimental imagery and media, particularly media aimed at children. But just for a moment, Let's go back to the evangelical aspect of this as we wind things down. I want to make this very, very clear. Evangelical thought is losing its foothold. If that weren't true, we wouldn't be seeing the societal outcry over things like the word Chinaman or where the black kid sits at the table for Thanksgiving in a Peanuts cartoon. These things would continue to be normalized in people's minds and no one would think anything of it. The fact that people do tells me that for all their effort to cancel everything about society that they don't like, evangelicals are going to start seeing just how much of a majority they are not. Oh, yeah, there's a lot of them. 25% of our country right. calls itself evangelical. That's one in four. One in four is a lot, so I'm not downplaying that. They still have a large, large degree of influence, and I'm not denying that either. But this last election proved something, at least it proved it to me, and I think it proved it to a lot of people, and I think that it was a tough pill to swallow for a lot of evangelicals, but it proved a point about their real political power. The growing acceptance of alternative lifestyles and the normalization of LGBTQ characters in popular media is further evidence that their attempt to steer thought on these things in a more conservative direction are failing. What this means is that those of us who recognize their game need to keep playing it and use what they've taught society against them. I'm not saying we should be making calls to cancel anything. I'm not saying strip them of their religious freedom. I'm not saying cancel the Bible, even though I think doing so would benefit society tremendously. I'm not saying any of that. 
What I'm saying is give them what they think they want. A society that holds people to their own morals and forces them to deal with their own actions. Make them accept the outcome of all elections as a manifestation of God's will and not just in instances where their candidates win. Call them out for being COVID deniers and anti-vaxxers and keep pounding their arguments with facts and truth. Call out their own media and keep people like David R. White in the hot seat when they distribute media that includes content that they would decry coming from any other source. Call out the words of TV preachers when they claim that they can heal COVID through a TV screen. Call them out in public. Call them in on their social media. Boycott their churches, podcasts, social media, and more. Cancel the validity of their messaging by holding them accountable for each and every word that comes out of their mouths. And don't let them get away with just saying whatever they want without validating and substantiating what they're saying. Encourage people not to think and behave the way they do. Call them out and make the truth known. Don't let them get away with saying or doing anything that can have a detrimental effect on society. Hold them to the same standards as they want to hold us in terms of what they believe and what they want society to look like. The more light we shine on the error of their ways, the fewer places they'll have to hide, the fewer people they'll be able to convince, and the more people will start seeing this religion for what it is. And when that happens, many, many more people will start getting and staying unbound. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Unbound. Show topics are chosen based on their timeliness, relevance, and social impact. Have suggestions for future topics? Email us at unbound.podcast.network at gmail.com with all your comments and feedback. Please don't forget to like, share, and throw a few five-star ratings our way and follow us on all major social platforms. And don't forget to hit subscribe if you haven't already. Links to our social pages as well as a full list of cited sources in today's episode are listed in the show notes available at our website, getunbound.org. Org. That's get-unbound.org. If you value this resource and would like to see it continue, please consider supporting us on Patreon at the link in the show description. And be sure to check for new updates every Sunday when we'll come together again and take one more step toward getting and staying unbound. Unbound.